We enjoyed one relatively quiet night at anchor, but the following day, some big catabatic gusts rolled through and hit Altor hard. That made us pull the anchor up, run with the wind, and head to Isafjorda. The wind is playing tricks on us today, going from 8 knots to 30 and back, but we are well into the journey now, and about 8 miles from Isafjord, and we can see on AIS that there are quite a few boats in the harbour already, but I hope there is place for us at the inn as well, because I am looking forward to plugging in, running the fan heater and having a hot shower. Amen to that. Welcome back to Adventure Now in Iceland, where other than a few days here and there, we are still waiting for the summer to catch up with us. Isafjorda is a busy port. Not only is it where a lot of yachts choose to wait for a weather window to cross over to Greenland, it's also a popular stop for the massive cruise ships. And coming in, we have a bit of traffic, but we can squeeze by. The yacht harbour is tucked around a corner and it's the perfect place to hide from the worst of the weather, just like the cockpit enclosure. It's a swell ship for the captain and a hell ship for the crew on a day like today. She is out there in the big breeze and cold driving rain. Looking forward to being tied up. We were just called by Mike on Pangi and we are rigging to go alongside him, starboard side too, and bows into the wind. You've seen those wide eyes staring into the lens. Our scariest day ever, we thought this is the end. No, 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 that's not our thing. Turbocharged drama and clickbait bling. We keep it real and if you like our vibe, do us a favor, don't forget to subscribe. Ah, oh, now that's better. The sun came out and the wind died down, giving us the chance to have a look around this lovely town. With a population of around 2,600 people, this is the largest settlement in the western fjords. Visiting Iceland in the summer, it's easy to forget what a hostile place this is during winter. With the mountains towering so steeply above the houses, winter snow brings a serious risk of avalanche. So in order to protect the town and its people, these huge walls have been constructed. Alongside the walls, forests are planted and that gave Poland the opportunity to go and smell some trees. I love walking through a forest like this with pines and spruces all around, especially on a sunny hot day because with the heat the sap of spruces and pines releases this beautiful fragrance one of my favorite smells. Reminds me of my childhood actually, because nearby my home, there was a pine forest where we used to play with my friends and sisters. And I remember the smell was just intoxicating. It was such a brilliant time. I treasure those memories. Back down in the town at sea level, you will find an eclectic mix between new and old buildings. Not long ago, Iceland experienced a period of growth that can only be described as explosive and it was all down to one industry. There is a distinct feeling of prosperity all over Iceland and I don't know whether these rainbows represent new school happy and gay or old school happy and gay, but we are old school happy and gay to be here. And as for that one prosperous industry, well more on that later. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Oh, I give you a fair option. You've got a free run. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. Isa Fjorda is behind us. And it's a bit of a moment for us on board here because we have uh, come to the decision that this is going to be our northernmost point of the season. Greenland has always been a possibility and a maybe, but originally we had planned to come into Reykjavik first and work up around the western fjords, across to Greenland, and then back into the north of Iceland, round the east and back down. The weather didn't allow us to do that, so we have found ourselves in the perfect push-off point for Greenland, with no weather to go. Mike tells us that the ice is still thick off the 
Greenland coast and we always said that we won't wait for a weather window anywhere. If it appears, we'll take it. And it hasn't appeared. Fate has dictated that we are bound for an Icelandic circumnavigation only, which excites me greatly because we've still got some wonderful places to explore. So without further ado, Ashi, let's get used to seeing the compass heading south again and enjoy ourselves in Iceland. And just like that, Greenland slipped off our radar this time round. But we were very excited about continuing our Icelandic adventure, especially as someone had just tipped us off that summer was about to get better. We went to the Harbour Master's office and I said to him, why is the weather on the security cameras so much better than it is here? He said, because they're on a couple of harbours south. So I have heard before that there's a microclimate up here which tends to be a bit cloudy. So now that we're off south, hopefully we'll get some sunshine. Because I think blue sky, snow-capped mountains and sunshine, come on, that's what we need. A bit of vitamin D on our skins. So as the sun comes out, let's talk about Iceland's transformation thanks to that one particular industry. This may appear to be the epitome of peace and tranquility, but in recent times, three wars have been fought here, all over something called white gold, also known as cod. Iceland can be a pretty inhospitable place, and due to the climate, there is little in the way of productive agricultural land. Iceland's main resource has always been its rich fish stocks. We've parked all tour in a lovely little spot here, a cute little anchorage opposite a town whose name I absolutely cannot pronounce for love nor money. But we are going to stay here tonight. It was one of the things we wanted to do more of this season and that was have life at anchor in Iceland. And that's exactly what we've got tonight. We'll have a gentle rock and roll as we go to sleep later on. What a lovely little spot. Good morning, Iceland. We've just topped up the tank with some more dinosaur squeezings, and now we're gonna pull the anchor up and head further south. Go get the Perkins. But the Perkins is sleeping. Well, you better go and wake him up then. Good morning, Perkins. Good morning. Until early into the 20th century, fishing here was conducted on a subsistence basis with old school man-powered rowing boats catching enough fish to feed their respective village. I can imagine the Icelandic people's frustration at watching modern foreign trawlers come into their waters catching vast amounts of fish and taking them away. The Icelandics proceeded to buy some old steam trawlers from Britain and with this new method of fishing, their prosperity boomed. As Mark Kolansky wrote in his book called Cod, this prosperity transformed Iceland from a 15th century colonial society to a modern post-war nation. But it was the continuous and increasing plundering of Icelandic waters by foreign trawlers that led to the start of the Cod Wars. At that time, Denmark was responsible for Iceland's defence policies, so Iceland could only control their fishing grounds up to four miles offshore. Sometimes the determination to sail defies logic. We've only got seven and a half knots of wind, but it is up the stern, so we are just gently cruising with the jib rolled out, doing a couple of knots. I think what might be slowing us down is the massive lure I've got trailing out behind the boat on the fishing rod. So we're hoping to catch some dinner. But Asha just said, what a beautiful place this is, just looking behind me up the fjord in the sunshine. It's absolutely lovely. In 1944, Iceland was granted independence from Denmark and in 1958, they increased the no fishing zone from four to 12 miles. Beautiful. This angered all of the European nations, but they reluctantly retreated to respect the rule, with the exception of one nation, the Brits. And the first Cod War was on. Oh wow, that's a big fish. Beautiful. Just motoring up this jaw-droppingly beautiful fjord. It's just something out of a fantasy land. Absolutely stunning. The way the gravel seems to fall down the slopes, it looks like it's in motion. And I guess it is, but just very slowly. 
and we're headed for a place called Pingiri, which I believe has a lovely old trawler service dock back in the days when British trawlers came up here fishing for cod before they imposed a limit. Apparently there was a big engineering shop here so we're going to go into the old port and have a look around. But having a look around just, you know, takes up all of your time here. It's an absolutely incredible, incredible backdrop of scenery we're going through here. Iceland used their fleet of seven armed patrol vessels to ward off the British trawlers. But in response, the Brits sent their navy. To describe the Icelandics as plucky would be an understatement, because at the height of these tensions, there were 37 British warships around the coast of Iceland. Between 1958 and 1976, there were three separate cod wars, and each one started when the Icelandics increased their no fishing zone. First from four miles offshore to 12, then from 12 to 50, and finally from 50 to 200. The limits were being imposed to counteract the rapidly depleting fish stocks, but each time the limits were increased, the Brits refused to comply. Although it would be incorrect to liken these conflicts to other wars that we are perhaps more familiar with, in each conflict, the violence steadily increased. We got up fairly early today to come and have a look around Pingiri. We found the tour guide here for the museum, but he's not very responsive, so we're a little bit early. So we've had to resort to sticking the camera through the windows to have a look at the old machine shop and the remnants of the trawler fixing industry that existed here a long time ago, which nature is slowly claiming back, but the emphasis is on slowly, I think. What do you reckon, mate? I hope you have a good season. Catch you later. In some not so happy and gay times, live rounds were fired at British trawlers by Icelandic patrol vessels. Iceland deployed their secret weapons technology, which involved towing cutting devices close behind the sterns of trawlers, sending their nets and the catches to the bottom of the sea. The retaliation was brutal and simple. The trawlers resorted to ramming the patrol vessels, and in the end, the British Navy got involved too, it sounds like it degenerated into bumper cars at sea, even though there wasn't a fairground pikey in sight. Each of the Cod Wars ended the same way, with Iceland playing their trump card. Being a member of NATO, they allowed the US military to have a base there, and owing to their strategic position, a weather eye could be kept on the Soviet Union during the increasing tensions of the Cold War. Iceland threatened to withdraw from NATO if Britain didn't back down. Clearly, Britain thought that these were three fights that they could win, but after pressure from NATO and indeed the US government, they finally backed down for good. Mark Kolansky wrote that when Icelanders see their cod stocks diminishing, they think about returning to the Middle Ages, earthen huts and metal shacks. This means that they will do anything to protect their fish. Some might say that the greatest tragedy here is that no one thought to ask the cod what they wanted, and if I were them, I'd feel well and truly battered. We've pushed off nice and early today, it's just before eight o'clock. We're taking advantage of the flat calm weather to get out of this fjord and make some progress down south. Our next destination is Petrikfjorda, which is a bigger town, I believe, which is good because tomorrow it's Asher's birthday and I'm hoping to find somewhere to take her for dinner. And that's a bit of a one-hoss town back there. Very nice, but no birthday venues. So let's get round and down a bit and see what we can find. I have no intention of starting Cod War 4, but there is a Brit well inside the 200 mile limit fishing for cod, and he is in. Right. I've just hooked into what is definitely the biggest fish. It was bigger than the one that I lost in Norway. And this is a big one. Let's see if we can get this thing on or whether it'll evade me. I think you're coming on, mate. It's a long way down, 50 meters. Here it comes. Come around this way, Ashi. That's a big fish. That's a big cod. 
Oh my fucking god! That's a monster! That's a big gun. Are we eating him? We're eating know. him. That's mental. It's... We're eating him. Are we? Yeah. We need to run the fridge. Yeah, we will. We have power, aren't we? Okay, yeah. We're going to do it. Sorry, mate. Can you get me the winch handle, please? Yeah. I don't know how heavy it is, but it's heavy. Biggest fish I've caught by a long, long way. And I do feel a bit guilty about taking this fish, as I do every fish. But you know what? He thought the lure was lunch, but actually he's lunch and dinner and lunch and dinner. Better get the freezer on. Beautiful specimen. You're a fine fish. Free range as they come. Yeah, I'm not sure this whole killing thing I do find difficult but you can't possibly eat animals in my opinion unless you're no I should rephrase that in order to eat animals with a clean conscience I need to know that I'm able to take them and it's not pleasant but it is the cycle of life and there we are well that's a good day's fishing congratulations and a personal record <laughs> like a throwback to the old school, we had clearly defined roles. I was the hunter, gatherer, provider, and Asher was in the homestead, making everything ship shape and Bristol fashion. We have food and shelter. Life is good. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Adventure Now. Altor, out. <laughs>